pop 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 pop
5.30 in the morning. And that means, and my hotel where I was staying was like 30 minutes away. And to make food for 30 people to show up, you need like at least an hour. So now it's like four o'clock in the morning. The, I'm waking see now up. for, if I may interject my own yes. experience as someone who's made films, uh, I always looked forward to the, uh, the day old remaindered bagels for breakfast. I, I it was never. like a treat for me to eat like stale bagels with uh, a tub of cream cheese. This is so where if, if someone was like, I've made you, you know, frittata, I would have yeah. been like, I, fuck your frittata. I want bagel. <laughs> I would have loved you. No. So I bought so many bagels day one, so many bagels. Cause I was like, I also love a stale bagel. No bagel was eaten on this entire set. Everybody went for, so day one, I made bacon and egg, sausage and egg McMuffins, and then wrapped all of those individually. Um, there was like a yogurt bar, fruit. There was like all this, is like a juice bar, coffee. There were all these things. And then nobody took a bagel. There was no bagel, no yogurt missing. Nothing that was prepackaged. All my sandwiches were gone. Day two, I was like, I got to ramp this up a little bit. So I went burrito. I went burrito day three. All 30 burritos out the door. Those stale bagels just sat there. So I ate stale bagels the entire week. <laughs> I'll tell you what, like, if, if you gave me a choice right now between a stale bagel or a breakfast burrito, I would take the stale bagel. And this is why we're friends, Tim. This is why we're friends. Um, like a freshly cooked breakfast burrito from the, I, from, I from do the hands not, of Carrie? Yeah. I do not like breakfast burritos. I love a breakfast thing. burrito. <laughs> Yeah, no, I hand rolled, I hand scrambled the eggs, two pans, did, one did, with bacon. Did you make the tortillas yourself? Uh, I did. I brought a tortilla flattener and I just whipped that up too, like first thing in the morning. I mean, that was the least of my problems. The taco bar, like what a nightmare because I was like, not everyone likes chicken. So I'm like, I got to do chicken and beef. So I had like multiple meat options. And then the actress that was there was a vegetarian. So I'm like, well, I have to have a soy meat option. And she's like, I don't really like soy meat. So I was like, well, good thing I have peppers. I'm going to saute <laughs> some pepper tacos. And I was just like, it was insane. It was insane. And I realized my job was like the least important job there. And yet I feel that like is not true. The most important job. That is yes. correct. Brennan is correct. Well, I would say that the director and the people working on the actual movie are slightly more important. I that is literally not correct. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, thanks. Thanks, then. Glad you're validating. I, I'm, I'm not saying this to compliment you. I'm saying this as someone who's been on a film shoot. You could literally just be like, you grip camera, but you cannot say, sorry, guys, we don't have food and expect everyone to be okay with that. Oh, well, you're yeah, boosting Speaking of someone who has been a director, yeah, food is way more important. Ah, uh, well, thanks. Well, thanks. It's funny you say that because everybody, and this is the thing where I left being like, again, I just smiled my way through the whole thing. You did not hear one peep that I was like, literally my back was just like sweating for like six days. I was so hot because I was just constantly moving because not only was I in charge of making all the food, I was in charge of like the coolers being stocked with like water and drinks. And it was like 90 degrees out. So people just drink so much water. I'm like, could we cool it? Could we cool it on the water a little bit? People were just drinking like crazy. And then you also have to have like a little crafty table with like chips and snacks and like granola bars. And so I had to keep that all stocked. And then like a weirdo, if I didn't see somebody eating, then I was like, oh, can I get you something to eat? So I was also like short order cooking to be like, can I make you a fresh burrito? I noticed you didn't get a burrito. So then I was like hand making like the people that didn't make it to the breakfast bar. And it was exhausting. So it would, it would start at like six o'clock in the morning. Like people would be arriving and everybody worked so hard. They worked all day. Like they would work until night. And so it was just like, I... I would finish up probably around 8 p.m. All the dishes. I was on all the dishes, all the garbage. <laughs> I'm on dishes, garbage. I don't even do this stuff in my own home. Like, this is stuff that I hate. I hate dishes. I hate garbage. That's Rob's job. And had to do all of that. And you had to be. Here's the other thing that's like had to be exactly on time because they have like such a tight window that they're actually allowed to eat. They get like 30 minutes to eat and the whole thing's thrown off if my if my falafel's not ready so you had to be like right on on the money for the food too yep holy shit <laughs> so <laughs> have, have you learned the lesson now that if rob somehow manages con to convince you to do this again uh, -huh. uh just like will it just be pans of ziti 
Um, you know what? I'll probably do it to myself again because I got so God many compliments. You, Everyone's like, I loved your Indian food. I did do the gyros. I did shawarma. I did Indian food. I did tacos. I did, gosh, what did I do? One day I did pizza. That was my shortcut, but it was two o'clock in the morning. So it's like the first call was at like 8 p.m. So they're like breakfast at 8 p.m. Like no one's eating breakfast at 8 p.m. So I made pulled pork. That was a disaster. I don't even know. I don't have never even eaten pulled pork. And I'm like <laughs> rotisseriing it. I'm like in a crock pot and the, the pork butt was too big. So I had to cut the pork butt. Worst experience of my life. Like you literally had to take a knife and cut this thing in half. I was literally cutting a pig in half. It was, it was I had to like go to a different place. I had to like, I had to like, <laughs> I had to like check out. It was disgusting. So I, yeah, it so yeah, pulled pork sandwiches the last night, and then and then pizza at like two o'clock in the morning, the last day of the shoot. But no complaints on the food. Everybody and no hair in the food. Everything was. Everything was delightful for everybody else. I thought I literally was going to murder myself halfway through yeah. with a smile on my face. <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to go walk down to this little pond over here. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are we are very glad that you found the fortitude to not drown, drown yourself, oh. to fill, rock, fill your pockets with rocks and walk into that pond. Uh, because it means we get to talk about movies. We do. We do. And you know what? It's not, it's going to get worse from there, uh, at least for the movies that I have to talk about today. Uh, today, in worth mentioning, I will be bringing two Patreon movies. And one of them, I think, was intended to be kind. Uh, my third cousin, twice removed, Anne Urell, has gifted me The Mirror Has Two Faces from 1996. Uh, and then from another patron, Gavin McDowell, I have 1989's Society. So those will be the two. You that just I'm said bringing. the word society with so much unbridled hatred and contempt. <laughs> yeah. Did it come across? I did. It did. Oh. I felt like if Gavin was in the room with you right now, it would be his head removed from his body. You know what? I, there is a little doll of him in the corner right now <laughs> that I've just been kind of like poking with some shikabob, some kebab sticks the last couple of days. But uh, we will get there. Those are the two that I'm going to bring. Brennan, what are you bringing today? Um, well, uh, thanks to patron Carl Beasley, I am here to talk about the 2018 movie Secrets in the Hot Spring. It's mm -hmm. it's not Secrets of the Hot Spring. It's a real sex in the city kind of a preposition nightmare. But we are, we are firmly in the hot spring. OK. okay. And Tim, what are you bringing? Uh, so I will also be bringing a request from a Patreon. Mine will be from a Patreon uh, WBTN, I believe is the name he uses on Discord and commenting on the site. Uh, and he uh, asked me to take a look at the 1965 film The Hill, directed by Sidney Lumet. Okay. And I believe then uh, we will all sort of collectively be bringing the recent box office phenomenon Barbie. I can't wait. That's going to get me through this episode because I got to talk to you guys <laughs> about it. So. You know what? I'll start it off since I have two that I'm going to bring. Again, I'd like to preface before I go into this review, Anne, I really do care about you as a person, as a human. I believe you to be kind, and I have no idea why you gave me this movie. I can't tell if it was a joke or if you love it, and so I'm 50% concerned that I'm going to offend you in some way, but just know that I care about you either way before I go into this. So have you guys seen this before I start? I I have seen this, yes. Okay, Brennan, what about you? I, I have not. That is exactly my weak spot for movies, is like the late 90s, early 2000s dramas and comedies. Drama com. I think this is like a drama rom com or something, I guess I would call it. I can't. Whatever tell it is, it sounds ugly and is difficult to say. I agree with that. It's all of those things. <laughs> I was so. I do like drama rama, though. This is not drama rama. This is okay. drama. Roma, or maybe it is a drama rama. It is a drama rama. So I think Alfonso Cuarón made a good drama rama. Yeah, he did. You guys are losing me here. Three hours of sleep. <laughs> so <laughs> let, I'll tell you about it. If you haven't seen it, I was so 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 excited to see this. This has my name all over it. A little romantic comedy, like you said, a little drama. 
I was certain, like from the 90s, mid 90s for me, this would have been something I would have watched on loop over and over and over again as a kid. So I was just shocked that I missed it. So when I saw that it was out here, I was like, ah, I just can't wait. So last night, Rob and I got together, we sat out on this porch, we snuggled up, we like with a glass of wine, put it out like just to to turn it on. And we thought it was going to be this like, ah, like date night. It was like date movie night. Ah. So (laughs) I'll tell you. How long did Rob make it before he uh, tapped out? Rob tapped out. He wanted to tap out. Like every 15 minutes, he's like, I'm tapping out. Every 15 minutes. And he held on for like an hour and 15. And he was just, by the end, he was like clutching his face so tightly because this movie is by far the one of the cringiest movies I've ever seen. And when I say cringe, you're just like, I can't believe they said that. Like, I can't believe they did that. Like, the writing, the acting, like, all of it is just so cringe. And so finally, he was just like, I can't carry. I, I have to go. Because <laughs> it's it's brutal. And I'll tell you why. So a little bit of background on it. So there's this shy middle-aged professor played by Jeff Bridges, a smoky Jeff Bridges. He's probably like in his 40s in this or something. He's looking good. Uh, enters into a, a romantic but non-physical relationship with an unlucky in love professor played by Barbara Streisand. Okay. So it's also important to note Barbara Streisand signed up to do this. She directed this willingly. She directed this, she directed this willingly. I'll say that too. Um, but holy cripes. Um, he... Jeff Bridges basically becomes sexually obsessed with every woman he comes in contact with that he's attracted to or finds attractive. So he, and he does this little like wilty thing. Like whenever he sees someone that he wants to, to, you know, you know, the thing, he gets kind of like, oh, and like he, his whole body wilts. So that's our indicator as a viewer that like, if he's attracted to you, he will get like weak in the knees essentially. So he comes up with this plan where he's like, you know what? I want to find somebody that I'm mentally connected to, but who's an uggo? Like that was his, that was his goal. And already Rob and I were like, where is this going? (laughs) What's happening? Um, And the, the particular uggo, and I won't even call her an uggo because she's beautiful, that he ends up finding is Barbara Streisand. So I don't want to spoil this for anybody, but don't see it. Um, Basically, things don't go as planned. Of course, it's what you expect to culminate where like they both start to have feelings for each other, but it is completely platonic. But then things, Barbara, Barbara wants things to get a little hot in the sheets it's a it's a worst case scenario of like bleh, he's like pushing her away like don't I, I I can't she's of course offended and then and then this is the ah it just keeps getting worse then Barbara goes through a training montage where she's eating celery and running so that she can like get in shape and the highlights her hair so like now she's a babe she like emerges like after this like snafu and ah, comes back. Literally the climax of the movie, Jeff Bridges literally says, I loved you before, even when you weren't beautiful. And that is somehow (laughs) endearing to her. Like, she's like, oh, and you loved me then and now, even though he explicitly says that, like, she wasn't beautiful without makeup and with, like, four extra pounds that she lost in the three days she went for a jog or something like that. I couldn't believe what I was watching like I kept expecting there to be some moral like Barbara Streisand was gonna punch him in the nards and run off and be like I'm gonna be single because I don't need this like I was expecting some sort of message but no it just that's where it landed it just landed on yep you were super ugly before nobody wanted you nobody liked you now you dyed your hair and now you can find love so it's basically saying beauty beauty equals People loving you is the moral. Yes. So is Barbara Streisand like made down at the beginning? So like there's more of a difference or is she just kind of Barbara Streisand? I think, she, I mean, Tim, you can tell me. I that, thought she looked like Barbara That's Streisand. part of the problem with the movie is that like. It's her face. She she is not going to permit herself to look unattractive on camera and she does not. And no. so it's this basically movie in which a beautiful woman wears ugly sweaters yes. and then becomes a beautiful woman wearing not ugly sweaters. She's wearing a black tight dress instead of sweatpants. And it's like, 
what? And he's like, I liked the the lady who didn't eat carrots. I liked the lady who ate extra salad dressing. Like, I still want the person like that. Wait, that's what the that's what the like quote unquote like slobby lady does. Is she just has a little extra salad. salad? Yeah, she has a she gets double salad dressing. So then she's just oh, obviously like what, indulgent. What a sin! What a sin! I just mindless indulgence. A glutton. A, yeah, just I mean, she's just pounding down the calories there. I mean, everybody is awful to Barbara in this movie. Her mother, her sister, like everybody is awful. And they basically all tell her that she's ugly and unattractive and unappealing. And the only thing that ran through my mind beyond just being like so cringed that this was created was how how does Barbara sign up for this? Like how does she say, yeah, I'm going to take this uh, movie where I'm being myself and I'm just going to like- I mean, not, not merely sign up for this, shepherd this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like shape this, make it her own. Yes. Pick this as the project that will be her, her third film as director and star. I, I blows my mind. I felt like it was such a slam at just like every feminist commentary that you would ever see in a movie. It was just, again, it was like, you weren't good enough and now you are, and it's all going to work out now in the end because you changed. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's all I, I don't even know i can't say anything else about it it was you know it's it's a horrible horrible movie um there was a, a minor controversy when this was new uh lauren bacall who plays her just vindictive horrible harpy horror. mother oh, that's um good casting you know uh was nominated for the oscar for supporting actress and was sort of widely expected to win in what would have been blatantly a career achievement oscar but everyone was like okay well lauren bacall needs one uh but instead juliette binoche won for the english patient and it was it was quite shocking and everyone was very surprised and juliette binoche clearly did not expect to win and you look at these two movies and you're like why would anyone alive prefer lauren bacall win for this just hellish performance Compared to Juliette Binoche being very good in her like big welcome to the English language film like cinema. And yet at the time it was a huge controversy. Mm. So there we go. Well, the Oscars have always engendered these controversies that don't make any sense, right. even in the moment. Um and I, I say re- I'm sorry, yeah. Go ahead. I just have a slight side tangent about Lauren Bacall. Um, which is that going around Twitter recently was uh, people talking about the the rudest celebrity encounter they've ever had. And someone was like, Lauren Bacall is the rudest celebrity. Uh, I was at a speaking engagement of hers. And afterwards, I walked up to her and was like, oh, I don't mean to bother you. And she just said, oh, honey, then don't and walked away. And <laughs> That's a I was good like, line. oh, it's so good. And I was just like, first of all, if you didn't expect Lauren Bacall to be rude to you, why did you talk to Lauren Bacall? <laughs> um, second of all, that was a positive experience getting dressed down by lauren bacall would have made my life absolutely you have a story that you will tell until you're 80 yeah exactly oh what a i I love her so much no i was just gonna i was gonna sort of cap things off my own feelings about this movie they're very old i saw this movie probably in 1997 last uh i think that barbara streisand is a kind of outlandishly terrible film director Mm -hmm. so so this being bad does not feel out of place with the rest of her work as a film director Yeah, to me. Oh, are you thumbs up or thumbs down on Yentl? I am thumbs down on Yentl. Yeah. It's, it's kind of turgid. It's very, it's, it's her best movie, but it's quite dull. Yeah. That's so sad. Anyway. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. I, this, this movie sounds like one I will not to be rushing to check it. Skip it. Skip it. I, uh, yeah, I need, I need that time back in my life, but still appreciate you, Anne. And for sharing that with me for, your reasons that you did. Um, I am going to pass it to Brennan now. Why don't you talk a little bit about your movie? Well, my bestie, my patron, uh, Carl Beasley, was a lot nicer to me. Um, I also don't have any context for why this title was chosen, but I, I'm glad to have been exposed to it. So I got to see Secrets in the Hot Spring. It is a 2018 Taiwanese horror comedy, much, much stronger on the comedy than on the horror. Um it's about basically these three high school students. The main character is this kind of super senior. He's uh, had to repeat the grade, I think, twice. Um, his name is Xiao Qin. Uh, basically, he's a bad boy. He's at a new school kind of restarting because he's... It's not that he's lazy. He's just like, you know, this disaffected. My hair is bleached and I just am not going to try in school. Um, but anyway... 
by defending so there's this kid who gets bullied because everybody thinks he's gay um and he ends up stopping this kid from getting beaten up in the bathroom which ignites this whole rumor that uh the bully that he beat up was trying to date the gay kid it's a whole thing so the bully's trying to get revenge on uh the super senior the the supposedly gay kid and this sophomore who is just around um and anyway, so uh, Shaochin goes to this hot spring that is run by his grandparents. And it was originally the uh, the dream of his deceased parents to run this hotel. But they they are deceased and as such cannot run a hotel. Uh, it's very difficult. Um, but so the other two kids tag along with him because they're kind of trying to escape the wrath of this bully. So all three of them end up going to this hotel run by his grandparents. The sophomore character has almost no character to him like his thing is that he kind of sleepwalks and he's kind of just does some goofy physical comedy but i don't really know what his thing is but the the other two characters are kind of fun to spend time with um but basically uh they're putting some time in like working on sprucing up this suffering hot spring hotel resort that there are no customers at um, but also they maybe have discovered that this hotel is being haunted by a, a mm. ghostly presence and they're trying to uncover the truth of what's going on here. Um, like, are his grandparents ghosts? Are they murderers? Are they merely skin flint uh, grandparents who run a hotel? <laughs> um, like I said, it's not very scary. Um, it's definitely trying to go for a... I mean, they specifically mentioned the uh, the ghost Kayako and uh, Sadako from The Ring and The Grudge and the ghostly presence is modeled after them. And so it has this, the there's some interesting visuals to that, at least in the sense of those are characters who exist already that are this creepy to look at, but that's kind of all that it's offering as far as scares. It's, it's much more trying to do like a slapsticky Scooby-Doo kind of comedy where the boys get scared and jump into each other's arms. Um, and overall, while it is about 25 minutes too long, <laughs> Um, sure, as movies are yeah no they they love to do this um it's pretty it's pretty fun um it basically it has this very snappy sense of humor like the the editing and the aesthetic of it really works together really well to give it a really make it well paced until a point where you're just kind of sick of it doing the thing that it does <laughs> um but basically there there are a bunch of really good moments like uh probably my favorite moment of just like filmmaking involved is that uh one of i think the sophomore guy he he gets his foot snagged on a on a loose nail and the grandparents who are just like well that didn't happen everything's perfect nothing nothing's a problem um while he is still like falling they have already hammered in the nail they're like that's not a problem it's fine <laughs> um and there's these kind of it's it's got a quickness to it and a, and a lightness on its feet and and there's kind of a, a goofy sense of humor like there's a there's a documentary that's seen on tv where this guy's uh um identity is being protected by a black bar across his eyes but at one point he leans forward and the bar doesn't move <laughs> okay. um so it, it it's just it's just got this goofy vibe um and it's i would actually compare it to monster squad probably in the Ooh. sense of like it's very much about these homosocial bonds being formed. And there's a lot of, well, th there is much more homoerotic subtext in this than monster squad. Cause these people are more of a sexual age. Uh, but it's also couched in all of this gay panic of like, Oh, well I, I, I can't touch you because we are both boys, but then they jump into each other's arms and you're supposed to go. Ah. Um, what year is this from? What? What year is this from? This is 2018, but it's also Taiwan. So other countries have different, uh, you know, uh, storytelling standards. And America has different storytelling standards than like what I have for gay storytelling. Yeah. Um, but I don't know exactly where Taiwan is at as far as LGBTQ representation on screen. Um, but I think that ultimately the story this is telling about like male bonding and male friendship uh, does challenge a lot of those kind of initial gay panic norms of theirs, but it never quite rises to properly being a gay movie, and that was a little disappointing to me. Mm. Um, Use your I could have done with it being fifty percent gayer, but it's a very good friendship movie. 
Um, I think the main character Shaoqin is very well developed. I think his the the way that he feels alienated by his peers and by the world around him, I think, is really, really interesting. Uh, the third act kind of is couched in a lot of maudlin stuff with his dead parents that I was like not that invested in. But I think overall it was it was it was a very fun ride. Okay. Um, and had a, a light sensibility. So you would recommend it you would like to the to a certain population, general population. How would you recommend it? God, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think I would recommend it to people who have some sort of grounding in non-Western comedy uh, from contemporary cinema. Because, like, it's it's. I don't know that it's a movie that I would sit someone down in front of and assume that they would love. But it's definitely one that. I don't think anybody would absolutely come out hating. Okay. Yeah, that is the, the trick about comedy is it really not even <clears throat> like from Western to non-Western cultures, like it is it is so specific in ways that are really hard to translate. Um I have certainly bounced off of this part of the world, like the comedy from from this part of the world in the past. So it it can be a real difficult thing to know if, if it's something that is for somebody or not. Very much. Although I think knowing Tim's taste, this it is a little broad and sticky, and I know you do kind of uh, have more of a taste for that than I do. So this might actually work for you in some capacity. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, you're you're definitely describing a movie that I'd be curious to check out, although probably not one that I'm going to like immediately go online after this episode is done to see where I can find it. No, you know? yeah, that, that's not that's yeah. I don't think I would recommend that to anyone, but like. If if you're wanting to experience, if you're wanting to broaden your horizons, I think this is a very solid, like, safe choice to to do that with. Okay, all right. That's a very specific recommendation. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> specific. Yeah. Speaking of specific, I, Tim, you also mm -hmm. have a very specific movie that you've brought. I do have a specific movie that I have brought. That movie is uh, again courtesy of WBTN, our Patreon supporter of some time now. Uh, the film is The Hill, directed by Sidney Lumet. Um, from a, if I understand the order correctly, it was written as a play by uh, R.S. Allen that was then adapted as a screenplay by Ray Rigby, and that later on the play was sort of turned back, or the screenplay was turned back into a new version of the play. Um, but either way, what this is about, this is a film set in uh, World War II in the Libyan desert where uh, the British are running a military prison, not a POW camp, but a, a prison for their own actual uh, misbehaving soldiers. And this um, military prison is run basically by uh, uh, Regimental Sergeant Major Wilson, played by Harry Andrews. Uh, everyone in this film is like a that guy for the most part. Like if you watch British movies of a certain generation, you will just see face after face after face that you recognize. Um, but so it's sort of run by, by Wilson, but um, the chief guard is <clears throat> staff Sergeant Williams played by Ian Hendry. Uh, and they are the two people who sort of have this idea that the prison should be this real punishing, horrible experience in general. So what they've done is uh, they've concocted a hill, a, artificially constructed hill right there in the middle of the prison yard <clears throat> and the main form of uh, discipline and punishment that they subject the prisoners to is to run up and down this hill often while wearing very heavy hot clothing in the scorching hot libyan sun so it's this just brutal brutal punishment and the prisoners of course do not take kindly to this and the one particular prisoner who who especially does not take kindly to this is uh joe roberts played by Sean Connery. Uh, so this is this is a movie that I think you would just absolutely love, Carrie, because mm. I know your feelings about it. Sounding Sean like that. It sounded like tell me more. <laughs> uh basically, yeah. So this is the movie that Sean Connery wanted to make very badly. Uh this came out in 1965. So at this point there have been three Connery James Bonds. Um Dr. No from Russia with Love and Goldfinger. And he was very concerned that even though the Bond films were bringing just a ton of money and prestige and fame, he was concerned that he was going to get sort of typecast as this kind of guy, like can only make these really insubstantial, meaningless popcorn movies that aren't really calling upon him to act. So he wanted to prove he could act. 
So he got this role. Uh, Sidney Lumet at this point was sort of in a very, very high point of his career. Um, he made his debut, uh, I think, eight years prior to this with 12 Angry Men. But sort of in the mid decade, he'd really begun establishing some, himself as this like cutting edge director of really like important prestige films. And in particular, um, he made a film called The Pawn Broker that premiered right around the time The Hill was in production, uh, which is kind of goofy and dated now, but it was at the time like an extremely, extremely serious uh, portrayal of the Holocaust as seen through a survivor of the Holocaust who is now a pawnbroker in New York. So Sidney Lumet is like a really big deal at this point. <clears throat> um, so it's Connery who wants to shake this matinee idol image, working with Sidney Lumet, who is, you know, just kind of swinging from art film hit to art film hit, uh, working together. And, and it's sort of a film that doesn't really tell a story as such. It's not like a Shawshank redemption esque, like we're going to see the prisoners, you know, rise above this abusive treatment. It's really more just about sort of sitting in this space and learning who all of these people are. And there's again, a huge, huge cast. I've already named uh, three people. Uh, Ian Bannon is in this Michael Redgrave. They're also sort of people who run the prison. Uh, some of the other prisoners include um, <clears throat> Ossie Davis, the American actor, uh, Roy Kinnear, Jack Watson, um, Alfred Lynch. So not necessarily like famous people for the most part, a couple of those names are famous, but just really, really good British and one American actor. Um, and so really what we're doing is we're just kind of sitting in this prison space, meeting these characters, sort of learning what makes them tick and seeing what happens when they're all, you know, guard and prisoner commander and prisoner alike, um, all being sort of pressed into this very horrible environment that is hot and cramped and and the sun is just this constant like harsh beating source of of light it's uh, shot in very very high contrast black and white by um oswald morris who's just one of the great british cinematographers of his generation uh so it's really less of of a story because you know in a way nothing really happens it's just we see the prisoners get angry and nothing can change because they don't really have any power uh we're just kind of sinking into that with them and just feeling this oppressive heat and this really violent despairing place and watching as all of these characters become their worst selves and the ones who are in power and are running the prison get to do a lot more damage as they become their worst selves basically because they're the ones with the guns in essence um so in other words carrie i think you would love this movie I mean, I think this would be your new favorite film. Is it kind of like the Green Mile? Would you uh, say? No, no. It is. It is not in any way like that. Uplifting in the way the Green Mile is. Oh, I loved the Green Mile. This, this is, is this a is a less to do with uh, Tom Hanks urinating. No scenes of Tom Hanks urinating. Not even a single one. Uh, it is a. Ex it is an extremely hopeless movie like there is no air here at all it is two hours and two minutes of feeling just completely trapped and crushed and miserable oh, you loved it didn't you what you loved it didn't you five stars one of the best <laughs> movies i've seen in literally years are you being serious wow i'm being deadly serious i am tempted in this moment to say this is sydney lumet's best film whoa i i was blown away by this film and i'm sure the reason that wbtn picked it for me um it is not a film people talk about it is not available on blu-ray like uh -huh. it is that sort of obscure uh, i ended up renting it it is streamable in hd but um never really found its audience it tanked at the time uh it didn't harm anyone's career lumet was you know riding high enough that it couldn't really harm him sean connery still had james bond pictures lined up but uh didn't really make a splash certainly not in the states got a couple bafta nominations but um just a film that people don't talk about and don't see. And I think Sidney Lumet is a great director. Like he's one of my absolute, absolute favorites. Uh, I knew about this film, but I hadn't seen it. Now that I've actually watched it, I think it's just a, a terribly powerful film about just men turning into beasts. Hmm. Like I won't say I loved it cause it's too dark and unpleasant to love, but I, I really thought this was just great, great filmmaking. Well, I will think about adding that to the list of some people that I know that like dark and tragic and sad things that are bleak. Um, Remember, come and see, Carrie. 
Yeah. <laughs> this is real come and see esque. Okay. Okay. I think I won't come and see it then. I think I will. I think I think you <laughs> would hate this movie beyond your ability to put it into words. You know, that's hard for me to imagine because I feel like there's so few movies that you can say, how do I possibly how do I possibly sum this up? Like how do I possibly sum up my feelings about something? Like you there's always something to say. So I have a hard time believing that I couldn't for that movie. Um because I really, really can't for the next movie that I have to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely, I actually genuinely have no review because I think my brain is actually broken. I think it's actually broken from watching this movie. Uh, with with some thanks to Gavin, I was able to experience 1989's Society. And... I also was able to talk Rob into watching it with me because I think I said, hey, it sounds like this is a movie about like some sort of orgy. And he's like, okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> I will say I, I have absolutely not the slightest difficulty in imagining your response. I do not know what I assumed Rob thought of it. I would love to sort of get okay. your report on that as well. Okay. I do want to back up to, I just, I actually don't, have any idea i don't know how to tell you what this movie's about or anybody that's listening i don't know how to do it i tried to like think about it i tried to take notes and i was like i don't know so this movie is a cluster this movie is the biggest cluster of a movie that i've ever seen i'm also going to be really really honest rob and i both thought it might improve the experience of watching the movie by having one no <laughs> you didn't it was a mistake. It was a mistake. Um, we did. And I thought it was going to be, I thought maybe it was like a light spectacle. And so maybe that would be fun. It wasn't a light spectacle. Um, I still don't know if it helped or hurt. I, I truly don't know. I'll tell you what happened. I I could hear the them saying words i could hear the actors saying words i could hear the they were using words they were saying words that i knew they were english but honestly they didn't ever fit together in the sentences they were in or in the dialogue that they were in so as an example somebody in the main character might say i think my parents are in a cult and the doctor was like well you always wanted to be a ballerina and it's like <laughs> i like I don't know what's happening. Like the whole, the whole movie, I was like, I don't know what's going on. And I kept feeling like I was so confused about there's this family and there's people, but they kind of seem like they're into each other. But then, so I was like, oh, maybe that's a, a guy that he met on the street. And it's like, no, it's his dad. So then I was like, well, no, they're not into <laughs> each other. And then there was a girl and I was like, oh, that must be his girlfriend. And then I was like, no, that's his sister. And I was like, oh, I don't know who anybody is. Like, <laughs> I couldn't keep track of this hodgepodge of super, super weird people. Uh, before I go into the synopsis, synop I can't even say the word because I'm so flabbergasted by this movie. Before I go into the synopsis, it was, this movie made no sense. This movie was all over the place. It was super confusing and nonsensical, I think is I, the best way. I am going to blame the chemicals for that a little bit, at least. Yeah. So you think this movie made sense to you? You were following it. I, I, I think it is a weird movie, but I think it, it has a pretty straightforward, like the weirdness is in what it's depicting, I think more so than the story itself. I just felt like scene to scene. I'm like, oh, now he's eating an apple. That's cool. This thing's chilling down. And then he like, it, it takes a is bite this of the apple. apple. His sex partner? It, no, it's just an apple. It's just an <laughs> apple. But then he takes a bite and there's just worms crawling out of it. And you're I, like, I, I want to first point out the fact that you were a little confused whether his sister was someone he was sleeping with, I don't think is a mistake. I think the film is like deliberately. So the film is basically saying that the rich are disgusting hedonists yeah. who destroy everything good and beautiful in the world. And this young man who is our protagonist is that sort of discovering that the hard way. And I think there's meant to be a little sense of like, well, of course they're, they do incest. They're rich. Yeah. 
Yes. I guess I didn't get the incest part at first because I wasn't expecting that. That was a bit of a curveball for me. I don't think I don't think there is incest. I just think you're meant to not necessarily be surprised if there was. I think there might be. So I'll I'll let me give you my one minute synopsis and you tell me if I'm wrong. So there's this kid who we think is likely adopted because he actually says, man, sometimes I feel like I'm adopted as one of the lines of the movie. So I was like, oh, is this a cue? Maybe he's adopted. He has sort of an odd relationship with his adopted slash maybe not adopted parents and his sister, maybe romantic partner, unknown. They sort of seem attracted to each other, but he also seems to be attracted to lots of other people that are in the movie as well. Then we quickly find out that there's something extra weird going on because he finds an audio recording or or his sister's ex-boyfriend gives him an audio recording of her and his parents like getting freaka freaka loo freaka leaky freaka freaka deaky that is that is an extremely actually correct word i i do not dispute the use of the word freaka loo thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much um somehow his therapist in, is involved and says yeah let me listen to this and tell you come back later and when he comes back later to get his tape it's like reprinted and the 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 freak a leak is gone and it's been replaced with other audio content and the guy's like I'm I think I'm losing my mind I'm pretty sure I heard that and now it's just like a regular tape and so he starts to kind of like lose his mind and then all of a sudden he's in like a he's giving a speech in front of a bunch of people and this lady goes basic instinct on him and just shows her undies and then all of a sudden she's like he's like really into her. And she ends up becoming the hero of this thing because she like saves him at the end of this. And then I don't want to spoil it, but like I think everybody's slugs. I think everybody, I think his whole family is are slugs. And then the slugs are eating people. I think the slugs want to eat him. I think his parents so, are slugs. So you did understand this movie. Is that right? Is that really I, what it was? Yes. The, the rich are slugs incestuous orgiastic slugs who want to eat people that's more or less the plot so they want to eat their son the slugs want to well, eat their as son. you said he might very well be adopted he, he might be a member of the poor classes that they are exploiting with their hedonistic wanton ways but are they aliens are they bugs what are they <laughs> aren't the rich aliens aren't the rich bugs don't you think that's true carrie <laughs> i mean yeah i mean yeah see this is the whole thing's a metaphor <laughs> I thought oh yeah, this, this movie is a satire. This is movie is one hundred percent a class satire. Oh. You could perhaps even say it's about society. Society. So, <laughs> this movie is just so bad. I just can't even tell you how much this movie was bad. And then I, again, I I had no idea. I mean, I guess it sounds like I did have an idea what was going on, but like. I don't know. At one point, they said they were like shunting. They were doing like a shunting of each other, which I had to look up. Do you know what shunting somebody means? I mean, I assume it involves putting a shunt in them. It's like tugging. So there's like a whole scene where they're shunting each other, which is like <clears throat> they like these these people are like absorbing other people's bodies, and so they have to like rub on them to like absorb you know who them. else absorbs other people's lives? Rich, rich. people. <laughs> <laughs> I just so is this a movie that you liked him? I love this movie. Oh my god. I gave this movie a heart on letterbox. Oh my gosh. This is uh, I, absurd. So so if I may add the the genre fan perspective, uh you very well might know this already, Brennan. This, this is um Brian Usna's first film as director after he parted ways with Stuart Gordon. Having collaborated with Gordon as director and Yuzna as producer on Reanimator and From Beyond. And it is extremely much a film from the producer of From Beyond and Reanimator trying to one up those films in terms of just being disgusting and gross and over the top and shocking, uh, but also smart and funny. And I think it is smart and funny. Yeah, which is, and that's totally my vibe. Which is why I'm th this one. Sadly, I've just not gotten to I, yet. I I don't know that you would love this movie. I think no. you would certainly be glad that you saw it, Brennan. Yeah, I mean, I like Brian Usna. I like, I mean, From Beyond is one of my my all time. From Beyond is favorites. one of the all time. Carrie, you need to check out From Beyond. You'd love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> More slugs. Um, also, I'd be I'd be remiss to not mention that this movie stars Billy Warlock, whose father is Dick Warlock. Oh. Um, 
That is an all time name. Yes. Yeah, st- uh, uh, check out our Empire. Wait, no. What the What the hell was that fucking movie that uh, was like phase, phase four. four our episode on a phase four that we did where we talked about uh all the best <clears throat> hollywood dicks i missed that episode but i'm gonna catch it now it the billy warlock himself is actually uh was one of the like steamy steamy guys from days of our lives for years and years after this i would oh. never have hired him after this i Tell me, Brennan, if you if this is something that you'd like to see. Would you love to see somebody reach up somebody else's anus and invert them and pull them inside out through their butthole? Yes, very much. Well, this is the movie for you. <laughs> you, you clearly do not understand the LGBTQ community the way you think you do, Carrie. It's so violent. It's so violent. I could see just like a hand, but like also, the can, can we rewind the conversation? Uh, through what orifice is is he reached up? I think his spice drawer. His spice. It's, he, I he gathered up as his much. Spice yes. drawer, and yeah, he got his pepper and he pulled it all the way through. And I, it's so grotesque. It's so like, what is happening? I just. I, I will say in your defense, Carrie, and I love this movie. I genuinely do. Uh, I think it has a slightly, I think the script leans a little bit too hard. on like the richer parasites. Do you think the richer parasites? Cause I think the richer parasites. And I agree with that, but um, I don't need to hear it 70 times in 85 minutes. Sure. Uh, so I love this movie, but I, I could have seen coming from 10 million miles away that you would have the worst possible response to it. And and I don't think it was very nice of Gavin to make you watch it. I don't. Well, think I, so I do either. think, I do think that he made her watch it for this reaction. Like he knew well, exactly obviously. what he was doing. He obviously, might, maybe I want. See, that's the thing. I don't like to be. I don't like to do that. I like if if he thought I wasn't going to like it, I'd like to be like actually. I really loved this movie. It was so good, <laughs> but it's so bad that I can't even do that. Like in good faith, I can't even spin this or bend this in any sort of way to be like i actually enjoyed it it is just terrible so thank you gavin for your continued patronage (laughs) and support of alternate ending we appreciate you um and for the record i'm actually really i have a a a patreon review request by gavin coming up that i'm very much looking forward to i bet you are i bet you are before we wrap up too much before we wrap up i want to spend a little time talking about my feelings today i've got some feelings and i want to hear your feelings as well everybody was raging in the last couple weeks about barbie and for me i've got a lot of feelings on it so i want to throw it to you guys uh, as two other moviegoers, I'd love to know your ratings. I'd love to know your feelings. Uh, I know you guys have both seen it. So, Brennan, what were your thoughts? What were your feelings on Barbie? Uh, well, obviously, Barbie is a is a difficult movie to approach uh, these days uh, because it, it comes with on this overwhelming tsunami of pre release hype. Um, it has become the the movie du jour of if you don't like it, that means you don't like women and are thus a bad person. Um, kind of uh, discourse. Well, it, it's so- kind of it's kind of complicated because if you don't like it, you don't like women. On the other hand, if you are like really, really, really feminist, you don't like this because it's mealy mouthed and hypocritical. So, like, it's kind of in this weird flux of of some feminists think it's great, some feminists think it's terrible, and it's all very complicated yeah it, it, it's all very complicated and and i wish like with any movie we could kind of just <clears throat> throw that in the trash can and talk about the movie itself um i think i mean i think i mean the movie is very mealy mouth i think the screenplay is probably it's it's weakest uh asset um definitely it was not as bad as i worried it would be when the trailer centered that uh pun about beaching people off which is not it does not have a foundation. It's just, it is a, it is a joke built on sand that is repeated 80 times and has, it, it well, is just, it's, it's well, would not a joke about beaches have to be built on sand? You're right. You're right. It is, but is it, uh, the, the tide has swept this joke away. And but no, I, I agree precisely with that response. The beach off lines from the trailer made me convinced I was going to give this like no higher than two stars. And that didn't turn out to be the case. So it sounds yeah, like we but, had similar arcs with the trailer. No, I'm, I'm I'm glad about that, and I'm glad I'm glad that I enjoyed. It. I gave it a seven out of ten um, on Letterbox. I I think that as an aesthetic object, it is something that is very much appealing to me and my sensibilities. Mm-hmm. I like the extreme 
uh staginess color blasting your eyeballs that uh that barbie land uh in the movie it, it, how it's presented um and I, I like a lot of the uh just general aesthetic things of the ways that margot robbie's performance especially brings about what would a what is a barbie physically capable of and, and how would she react to objects uh in a, like a live action space um I have, I have more to say but i think i'll throw it to tim I um I I co-sign a lot of what you just said Brennan. I think that the the how would Barbie if she came to life interact with the real the real world um it's not very creative like it, it works like they land the jokes but I think the jokes are all sort of very much the like the obvious jokes to go with. I also think the film does suffer a little bit from having a version of Los Angeles that itself is not devoid of cartoony stylization. Like when they go to Mattel headquarters at a certain point, Mattel headquarters is like very fanciful, very clearly inspired by uh, Jacques Tati's playtime, not a real space. And I feel for the movie to really be its best self, it needed um, to have like a, a sharper contrast between the plastic fake colorful world of Barbie land and the sort of grotty real world that I, I think doesn't quite come off visually. Um, I would agree with you. I think it's a very mealy mouth script. I, I think this movie genuinely, genuinely wants to be everything for everybody, but it also wants to say serious lacerating truths about the world in which we live. And you cannot do both of those things. Like you, you cannot make every single person love you if you are also trying to speak truth to power. And I, I think it, it is trying very, very hard to do both of those things and just kind of end up, ends up getting very muddy, especially in the last quarter or so. Um, yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was cute. Um, I didn't love the humor, but I liked the humor more than I thought I would. Uh, insofar as I thought the humor was going to make me want to claw the skin off my face. And it certainly didn't. I laughed. <laughs> I laughed multiple times even. Um, I, I think it's fine. I don't think I have any real problems with the movie. It just, it didn't really, if it had not been like a big cultural event upon which we all had to have an opinion, I would just be like, yeah, that was a movie I saw and move on to the next movie that I saw. Uh, but since it is a cultural event, I'm like, well, I don't know. I feel slightly annoyed by it because I feel like it's a big deal and I don't see much big deal ish about it other than sort of the fact that it did have this hype that it needed to live up to. I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it it's a challenging thing, but I think, uh, I, I, I'm Desperate to hear, Carrie, what your thoughts are about this Because it sounds and, like you you are the opposite of me, Carrie, in that you have feelings, and I, I sort of specifically don't, well, I think, in a way. I, you know what? I think I don't either, interestingly, but I think mine's more compelling because I should, I think. <laughs> so it's that's the weirdest part about it for me was I, gosh, I just, this had me written all over it. I wasn't a Barbie girl when I was younger. It wasn't my thing, but I still grew up with it. I've still had, uh, the Barbies that I like cut their hair off. Like I was the one that cut the hair off the Barbies and like painted stuff on their face. Like I was just not a big, like delicate Barbie person, but, um, yeah, I just expect my bar, my expectations for what this thing was going to do were just off the charts. I was like, this is going this, to. This was your number one most anticipated of the summer, correct? Uh, it was up there. I think it was Indiana Jones. Was no, higher. it was number two. Indiana yeah, Jones yeah. was your number one. Yeah. That's right. And I just thought Greta Gerwig, she's going to like just take this. She's going to run with it. I had heard all the things about inclusion and the message and just all of these things that we were going to sort of like upend perspectives, I think was what I was coming in with. And I felt like, and again, I'll back up everybody that I saw that was a woman that was like five stars, five stars. And I was like, Ooh, like I just. It, I, it was not five star movie for me. Like I enjoyed it for the same reasons that Brennan did. I loved the set pieces. I loved the way they recreated things. I loved the way they did the houses and the grass, like all of that. But going back to the problems I had with it, it felt like even, even America's speech, like where she gives that monologue about women that everybody was ooing and eyeing over. America Ferreira. By yes. The way. America Ferreira. Yes. Uh, the spirit of embodied America sorry, makes a monologue. Sorry, for kind of actually literally. America Ferreira. It was like, yeah, like we're all nodding our head and we're looking around and we're like, yeah, everything she said is true, but it's also like everything that we already know, you know, like I think I expected it to like 
share a perspective that we haven't seen or thought of that made people say, ah, oh my gosh, you're right. And it just felt so like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Every piece of this film's message, and I think saying that this film has a message is not correct because I think it has several and I Mm -hmm. don't think that they're all talking to each other. Every piece of the message feels vetted in that way. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. And then even the part where like, you know, I even more than the message that America Ferrer gave, I almost like I appreciated the message more on the masculinity side where it's like we expect men to be tough and not cry and like not have feelings. And we expect all of those things. We don't want them to be needy and we don't want all of those things. So I almost liked the way that they created a little bit more subtlety in Ken's character of like of that piece. It didn't have to be so overt on the nose. It was just kind of the subtlety of like, yeah, he's obviously lashing out and he's mean and he's angry because he's hurt. And I kind of liked the way that they tease that in there more than the like, yeah, women work hard. We have to bust our butts and do all this stuff and are held to all these double standards. Like all of that stuff just felt like, I don't know, just felt like, yeah, yeah, agreed. But I don't think you surprised anybody in the room, I guess, right. with that. And, and I, yeah. I think it's it's telling, and I've seen this, this sentiment sh- uh, crop up a lot, that like the Ken material is in some ways the most compelling. That feels like wrong. Pro- <laughs> like the Ken material shouldn't be the yes. best part of the movie. Yes, this is yeah. what I said. I said the same thing. I said, I'm bothered by the fact that the parts where I'm laughing the most, the parts where I was like actually out loud laughing were Alan. I was laughing at Alan Barbie and I was also laughing at Ken Barbie. I was laughing at the male Barbies and I'm like, I don't want to be laughing at the male Barbies, but they're really funny and Alan's funny. I like, it wasn't as funny on again. Uh, oh gosh. Who was the chopped up Barbie? Um, Kate McKinnon. Kate, McKinnon. Kate, McKinnon. Kate McKinnon. Like I expected her to be funny and it just wasn't. Oh yeah. Kate I mean, McKinnon is really coasting. That's the thing. Kate movie. McKinnon at this point has determined that she can do the same thing in every movie and get paid for it. And that is fine with her. And why not? We had generations of movie stars doing just that, but it's definitely a Kate McKinnon performance. Yeah. And, and I, I, uh, I think that uh, uh, the Ryan Gosling performance is no, I don't I wouldn't say that he's coasting, but I think he's he's doing the thing that he does very well, but to slightly less good effect here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think his best roles are when he plays just an absolute loser who can't do shit right. Um, I think La La Land is a per, an early or a a, a, a a smaller version of that, but especially mm-hmm. the nice guys, I think is like yeah. a key Ryan Gosling role where he's kind of shitty. Um and I, I think that it harnesses that but doesn't ask him to do too much yeah. with it gosling in this movie reminded me of bradley cooper in um licorice pizza and that mm. it's it's a very fun and funny performance but it also feels like it is exactly the performance that was in the script yes exactly there's not there's no extra uh mustard on it um and i will say uh, about the, the the issue that you brought up carrie with the uh, america ferrera's big monologue i think that uh the aside from just not really tying in with the themes that will either be in like the, the next couple scenes or the scenes previous, really mm-hmm. um, that monologue comes from a character who we've spent almost no time with and is really yes. one dimensional. Yeah. Um, I think America Ferreira is good at delivering mom energy. Yep. <laughs> um, I think that she is doing her absolute best with that role, but there there's nothing, there's nothing the there page. for her. Yeah. For, for that big thing to come from and it does it just doesn't work coming from her because yeah. we don't know her yeah we don't know her yeah no i agree and it comes out of nowhere and it felt like it was seed that was planted like we got to get this speech in here somewhere where do we put it well let's put it here like and then it just felt kind of taped in there rather than actually fitting in there for me again like yeah i was like yeah i agree yay but i just didn't feel like it it hit right or it hit as powerfully as it could um and my other gripe with it was I felt like I was pitched that this was going to be all about like diversity and representation. And yes, they had a character that wasn't a size two. And yes, they had a trans character that was in there, but they were just there. Like they were just there, like in the background. It wasn't like you ever brought any of this like commentary about the representation in. It was just sort of like, yep, Blink, blink, I'm going to put these, we're going to put a pregnant Barbie over here. Like, yes, we're going to have like some of the diversity in here. And it just felt like you could have done so much more with that in terms of like that commentary. 
It felt a lot like when Disney has one of their very many first ever gay characters in a movie, and you can tell that they were placed into the edit such that they could cut that character out without affecting to. the narrative because they want the film to be able to release in Dubai. Yeah. Yeah. And and actually, I, I actually think that um, Barbie, uh, the Barbie ensemble suffers from a lot of the same issues that the Oppenheimer ensembles with uh, ensemble does, which is kind of funny because, you know, there there is that connection between them that they they're both packed with these like recognizable names, a lot of A-list actors. But beyond two or three people who aren't the main leads, the ensembles are so malnourished mm-hmm. in both movies. Absolutely. Um. Like be, you get like you get to hang out a little bit with the Simu Liu Ken, but the other Kens have nothing. Like, why is Kingsley Ben a deer in this movie? I don't, I don't know why he was invited. Like, he's just wasting his time on screen. Um, and so are the bulk of the Barbies and Kens, unfortunately. Hundred percent. That's that's a really perfect uh, comparison because obviously <clears throat> the whole thing that everyone cares about is like, oh my god, you guys, they released two movies that are pursuing two different target audiences the same day. Isn't that weird? No, but also um, yeah. that is, I think, something that they both do very much have in common is that they they are they are messy and overstuffed in ways <clears throat> that are not necessarily interesting or productive, especially as far as their ensembles go. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe we'll get to spend more time with them in the Barbie Two, where Barbie where Polly two. Pocket shows up and they fight the GI Joes. Yes, I am very excited for how many wrong lessons are going to be learned from Barbie's success financially. Oh my god! It's I am something. there for it. I would see the He-Man She-Ra team up with Barbie any any day compared to this. But again, nevertheless, I did like it. Bar was too high, but I'm glad that I think it sounds like all three of us were in the same in the same boat. I was hoping maybe you guys would change my mind, but alas, you've just solidified uh, my opinion on it. So I'll take that too. I'll take that too. <laughs> so. Well, thank you guys for getting together with me to talk about movies. It always, always. feels good. I needed this after the uh, the week that I had last week. Yeah, it um, sounds like you haven't spent enough time thinking about movies lately. So No, no. Just making sure there's enough cheese on the table, as <laughs> a good Wisconsin lady does. But for those listening, we do want to thank you for joining us. In closing, want to thank you and also ask you to go out onto social media. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, on alternateending.com for all of our content there and next week it sounds like we'll be back with a top five so be on the lookout for a podcast preview on the site this week all right we'll catch you next time